All right, off they go. If you have your Bibles, let's turn together to Matthew chapter 7. Hey, I want to just uh, give a shout out to all the people that made the uh, Christmas event, the women's Christmas event yesterday, such a success. I heard it was awesome. Amen? Amen. And, you know, it's just, I was just so proud of all the guys setting up here Friday, the ladies that were doing all the decorating Friday, and then I was here Friday night. But then I heard that yesterday, uh, just the testimonies that everybody was given was just so encouraging, and I just, we got just great reports. So thank you all that were part of that, and it's just great to be able to see God work uh, this time of every year. It's, it's just been so blessed over the years. Every year, you know, I know my wife has had a team of people to put this on, and it's always just been such a great blessing and a way for us to really celebrate the fact that Jesus came into this world. Amen? It's like, without that, we'd all be in a world of hurt. So it's a very important thing that we do celebrate. Um, and even though it probably wasn't December 25th, okay? I mean, it doesn't matter. The fact is, we choose a time to celebrate the coming of Jesus into this world, and that's what's important. Well, Matthew chapter 7, this is actually the second part of a two-part series, so if you weren't here last week, hey, awesome, you get the benefit of last week's message this week too, okay? Uh, and if you are here both weeks, then great, this won't be a review too much, um, but I just want to catch us up a little bit. Now, the whole thing is, is that in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says a statement that, as I pointed out last week, is probably the most quoted verse by people just that are out in the world, okay? That maybe don't, don't know a whole lot of scripture, but they know this one. Do not judge, okay? <laughs> because if you ever say anything, if you ever stand up for what you believe is right according to the word of God, you know, and, and you say, hey, well, hey, you know, the Bible says this is wrong, that's the first one they'll pop up, you know? Hey, doesn't it say do not judge? So it does say that. But as we saw last week, uh, it doesn't mean there's no judging at all. Because if that were the case, how in the world could we ever distinguish between good and evil, you see? We have to be able to distinguish between good and evil. Because we're going to be held accountable for that. We're all going to stand before God and give an account of ourselves. Now sometimes, you know, I'd like to give an account for somebody else. Uh, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I'm going to have to give an account of, for myself. You're going to have to give an account for yourself. And we will all stand before God one day. And if you think about it, God is very gracious and merciful because, you know, he gives us his truth. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the way of salvation so that we can be prepared for that day. Because you know what? He wants us to shine. He wants us to succeed. He wants to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant, come in to the, this wonderful place that I've prepared for you uh, and that we might enjoy eternity together. Amen? So everything in this life is about getting ready for eternal life, or it should be. Because if you go through this whole life, you know, and you haven't made preparation for eternity, you've missed the purpose of this life. This life is your, as a gift from God to us. And what's really important is that we choose to follow the Lord in this life because that's the thing that's going to matter for eternity. Now, if we couldn't judge, then we wouldn't be able to judge what's the way of eternal life. You see, we have to be able to judge what is truth and what is error. What is truth? What is falsehood? And all of those judgments are very, very critical. And that's why God has given to us his word so that we might judge between truth and error between that which is true from God and that which is a lie from Satan, you see? And so we have to be able to make judgments about many things. And, uh, and, and so Jesus is not saying that you don't judge at all, but he is talking about a specific kinds of judging that people will do that are wrong. And we looked at those last week. So let's go ahead and take a look. Just as a review... Um, there we go. Oh, I love it when it works. Okay, so these are ways that you can wrongfully judge. I'm just going to go through this quickly. 
You can always check out the YouTube thing for last week if you want. But uh, judging hypo hy hy hypercritically, you know what that means? That means it's like you are pointing the finger out at everybody's faults, okay? That's what the Pharisees were so good at. Hypercritically or harshly, or there's a word called censorious. It means to be super critical of things, you know? And that's not right. And the reason, oh, back up. The, whoa. The reason it's not right is this. Whatever measure you use to judge somebody else, the Lord says that's the same measure that's going to be used to you. So that means that I want to be really merciful to others. You know why? I want God to be really merciful to me. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Okay, so that's that. Judging hypocritically. Remember Jesus, when he was asked, well, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Moses says, stoner, what do you say? And Jesus said, well, I'll tell you what. Whoever is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So Jesus was showing us there that we don't go casting stones unless we're without sin. Well, that kind of levels the playing field, doesn't it? I mean, it's just like, no, who, who can throw stones based on that? And so the idea here is that we should not judge somebody else for doing something that we are doing. That's not right. Okay? Uh, judging by appearance. You know, we can make snap judgments on things. We judge people by the way they look, on the outward, without getting down to the facts. Or maybe we hear just a little rumor about something. Well, so-and-so said, you know, well, she, she said that he said that they said that, you know. And then we judge by hearsay. That's not acceptable. We have to carefully investigate and make a right judgment. And then judging presumptuously would be to judge where it's really not your place to judge. Paul says, you know, who are you to judge somebody else's servant? You can't go to, you know, to somebody else's place of employment and start judging the employees there because they're not your employees. And the idea here is that we're each going to give an account to our master, Jesus Christ, and we're going to give an account to him. I, it's not for me to judge you in that way because you're his servant. You're not my servant, you see. So judging presumptuously would be to judge where you really have no jurisdiction. Now, if you're a parent, you have jurisdiction. Like I said, you can be the, the prosecuting attorney, the judge, even the executioner. Well, maybe not the executioner, <laughs> but certainly the jailer. You're in time out, you know. Uh, <laughs> so we all have these areas where God has given us judgment and we have to be good at it we have to be good judges in those areas so okay and then judging prematurely paul said don't judge anything until the appropriate time wait till the lord comes he was talking about not judging servants in the church of god waiting until god will ultimately bring judgment and we can kind of jump the gun on that and then judging the person this is probably the big one we can judge people's actions as to whether they are right or wrong we can judge their words are they telling the truth are they telling lies are they gossiping are they you know slandering or those things we can judge as to whether they're right or wrong but we can't judge the person i don't know god is going to be the one you know god knows those who are his own he's the one that determines if we are saved or lost and that's something that's an individual thing with each of us we ought to all know that we're saved and let me just tell you, if you are saved, the Bible says that the Spirit of God bears with you, your spirit, that you are a child of God. Amen? You, I like to say you know in your knower if you're saved. And if you don't know in your knower, then you better make your calling and election sure. We'll give you a chance today to do that. Amen? Because <laughs> you want to know that your name is written in heaven. But I can't judge that for you. I can't say, oh yeah, so and so is a you know, they're, they're in and, or they're not. I think of one of the things about heaven is that we're going to be all surprised. We're going to be surprised, number one, to see who made it. What? Are you kidding me? You're here. Uh, <laughs> I, then I think we're going to be surprised to see who didn't make it. What? We're so-and-so. Well, you know, you see, the thing is, is that God really knows the heart. We don't know the heart. And some people, are, they're, they're posers. They're pretenders. They're hypocrites. And they won't be there, you know. But there are other people that, you know, we're just going to be surprised. Maybe, maybe their last moment as they're dying, you know, they say, Jesus, save me. I'm a sinner. Boom. Their name's written in heaven, you know. It's like, and, you know. 
you could say, well, their name was already all, all, always written in heaven, and you would be right, because God knows the beginning from the end. But let's not go there. <laughs> that just blows brain fuses, okay? Um, okay, so, so now we get into what is rightful judging. There is rightful judging that we must do. Uh, as I said, that's important. The first is of yourself. Now, earlier Jesus said, you recall, he said, you know, why are you trying to pick out the speck in your brother's eye? And you don't see that you have a plank in your own eye. Okay? Now, if, if you have a speck in your eye and you got somebody coming at you, wanting to pull it out, and they've got a stinking two-by-four sticking out of their eye, you don't want them to get near you, okay? Because they're going to clobber you over the head with a two-by-four sticking out of their eye. Amen? So Jesus says, hey, before you try to pull the speck out of somebody else's eye, guess what? You need to first pull out the two-by-four in your own eye. And that is your own unloving reaction to somebody else's sin. See, when we're talking about pulling a speck out of somebody's eye, it's talking about maybe it's a sin that they're not recognizing they're doing. Okay, now, now I have changed a lot in this, by the way, with regard to my wife. The first time that we dated, went over to her house, her parents' house, see, her dad made barbecue chicken. I'll never forget, you know, because it's like the first time you're meeting the parents and you're trying to, like, make, you know, the meet the parents thing. You're trying to make a good impression. And, uh, and, of course, Cindy wanted me to make a good impression, right? You know, because this is dad checking me out. Uh, and so he had this, like, super messy barbecue chicken. And, like, I got it on my face. And, uh, which is not unusual. Usually like, face, clothing, socks. No, I don't know. Uh, but Cindy, she takes a napkin. She goes, let me get you got this. And she starts to dab it with my hand. What are you doing? You know, I can get that myself, you know. Uh, and, uh, and she was just like shocked, right? Now, you see, things have changed. Because now it's just like, you know, yeah, whatever. You know, you got to clean up, clean up. She'll come after me with the lint brush before I go to church on Sunday, you know. <laughs> just whatever, here I am. Just do what you need to do, you know. <laughs> you sort of change after a while. But, um, but the idea here is that uh, you need to first pull the speck out of your own eye before you can really see to remove those specks, which is to help your brother or your sister see something that they don't see or can't get it out on their own. And you help them. But you do it from the right attitude, you see. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now, when it comes to searching ourselves, to examining ourselves, judging ourselves, you know, David knew all about this. And I love this in Psalm 139 because he said, Search me, O God. And know my heart, try me, and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So David knew that, number one, this was nothing he could do on his own. He needed God's help. And I would say that that is absolutely right. That we need God's help when it comes to even judging ourselves. Because there's one of two extremes that we can easily go to. One is that we're just, we're, we're, we're so hard on ourselves that we, we self-condemn, you know. Well, I'm no good at anything, you know. I, I, can't do any, you know, I can't do anything right, you know. Or we just beat ourselves up. And honestly, I think sort of the way you were raised kind of shows if you've got a bent toward that or not. And, and, and then you end up being way harder on yourself than the Lord ever would be. Why? Because Jesus says, because it says in the Bible that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? See, so that's one extreme. The other extreme is that, and by the way, if you've ever read uh, Oswald Chambers' My Utmost for His Highest, he talks about this thing called morbid introspection. That's what he's talking about. This sort of sickly, sort of uh, just examining yourself to the point that you, it just discourages you and you feel condemned, and that's not right. The other thing is that you can go to the other extreme, which is you just gloss over all your faults, you know? But the Bible says that whoever covers over a transgression will not prosper. 
So it's not to your benefit to just cover over your faults and never deal with them. It's like, you know, sweeping it all under the carpet or something. It doesn't go away and you'll still be in a place of disease, really, because that's what sin does to you. It corrupts you. So what you really need is what David said here, which is, God, search my heart. I need your help. I need you to show me the things I'm not seeing. And then when you show me, and, and you show me through the word, or you convict me by your spirit, or however it is, then I will say, amen. Okay, truth. You're right, Lord. You are right. And I will let you forgive me, because you've already paid the price. You just want me to confess it and turn from it. And you will cleanse me. Amen? That's how it works. I kind of look at this like, you know, on your computer, you got like this virus scanner. You ever seen those? And it just basically searches through your computer to find any bad code. You know, code that's going to corrupt your files, could destroy your computer. And, you know, there's all of these people out there. What on earth are they doing to, like, spend all this time trying to figure out code that's going to mess you up? You know, you wonder, really? Is that your job? Are you serious? Uh, but there's people out there doing it, right? And so the virus scanner will show you, you know, Okay, this, it go, it, I love it because it sort of goes in and it seeks and destroys. <laughs> it finds the bad code and it, you know, it eliminates it. And I kind of look, that's the way God is, you know. Say, like, Lord, you know, search my heart. Show me if there's any bad code in me. <laughs> if there's any lies that I have allowed to take root in my heart. Because that's what it is. That's, how, that's really what the devil can do to, in the life of a believer. All he can really do is lie to you. And, he, and he, he sows lies. You get them from the world. You get them from Satan. You get them from your own flesh. But you believe a lie. And that will corrupt you. So God has to come in, show, expose through the light of his word what those lies are. And we can say, okay, Lord, thank you for showing me that. I confess it. I don't want that. Remove it, bing, and you're cleansed. Okay? Um, next thing is, we have, that's God's part. So God's part is to show us. Our part is to also judge ourselves. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Okay, now the, the context of this is with the Lord's Supper, which we're going to take in, later in the, in the service here today. The problem was, is that the people were gathering together for communion, uh, you know, and they have a meal, and some people were just eating, they didn't care about anybody else, they would just fill themselves up, and other people were, were, were going hungry, you know, it was just a mess. It was done disorderly. And, and when they were eating and, and partaking of communion, which is to remember the, the death of Jesus, his body that was sacrificed, his blood that was shed, they weren't even looking at it and discerning the, rightly the body of Christ in their communion as they were partaking in this. And Paul said, look, because of this, some of you have actually died. You haven't rightly discerned the body of Christ. Some of you are sickly because you haven't rightly discerned the body of Christ. Maybe he was saying that you could have been healed, but because you weren't, they died, you see. Uh, or maybe he was saying that, look, God's judgment is on you because you're just rushing ahead, feeding yourself, but you haven't really understood what this means, okay? And that's the context in which he says this. Now, we need to judge ourselves. Lest we're not, so that we're not judged. And God would rather that with his help, we have him search our hearts, we judge our own actions, we judge our own words, so that we won't be judged by God, you see. But then he says, now when we are as believers judged by God, then this is the reason. Because he is a good father, he will chasten us, he will discipline us. If you don't judge yourself, I mean, you know, you get this as a parent, right? You, you tell your kids, go clean your room. When you clean your room, you can go play with your, kid, your friends, you know? They don't, 
clean their room. They go out and they play, and then they deal with the consequences when they get back, which is the wrath of dad, okay? <laughs> you didn't do what I said, you know? Okay, now you as a father, you really, I mean, you really don't, I, unless you're like really weird uh, and wrong, you don't really enjoy punishing your kids. You would much rather that they simply go clean their room before they go play. Everybody's happy. And, and I think God is the same way. He, he doesn't want to judge you. He wants you to judge yourself. But if he does judge you, it's because he will chasten you. He will discipline you so that you're not condemned with the world. Amen? That's what Paul is saying here. It's so that you're not condemned with the world. And so don't, don't despise the chastening of God if he disciplines you because you're in the wrong and you're dealing with some bad consequences you don't like. Listen, he's doing that because he doesn't want you to be condemned with the world, which would mean hell. So, you know, that's why if you're his kid, he disciplines you. Uh, and so, but if you do it yourself, then you don't have to deal with the Lord's discipline. Amen? That's what he's saying. Here's the beautiful promise. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, folks, it doesn't matter what you have done. You might come here today and you, and you just feel like you've done everything wrong in your life. And your whole life is messed up because of it. Whatever. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost your family. Whatever. Whatever you have done, let me just tell you, you are just one prayer away from forgiveness from God Almighty. You cannot have out sinned the power of the cross to forgive you of your sin. If you will confess it, which means to agree with God about it, you don't sugarcoat it, you don't call it something it's not, you call it, God, you said this is sin, yes, it's sin. And you're willing to turn from it. Turn from it with all your heart. I don't want that anymore. It doesn't mean you'll never stumble again. It just means in your heart, you're desiring to turn from those things that are killing you. Because the wages of sin is death. And, and if you will do that, 1 John 1, 9, God will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but I love it when I walk into the house and it has been cleaned, okay? I love the feeling, you know? I love it when you walk in and it's just clean, okay? I don't know. There are some people that live in filth. And I don't know how they do that. It would drive me absolutely bonkers. I went, I dated a girl, okay? I was 18 years old. First date, it was not Cindy. I'm getting this straight right now, okay? <laughs> go to her house. We're, we're going to go out for dinner. I walk in. She lived alone. There was cat feces all over the carpet, okay? Let me just tell you that was the first and last date, Okay? Because I just imagine, oh my gosh, if I ever married this woman, this is my house. You know? You get me? Okay, so... <laughs> I don't know how this illustration is going to wrap around here, but, <laughs> but the, the point is that, you know, when God comes and cleans your house, man, it is great. It's awesome. There's no sin. There's no corruption. You can live in the light. You can walk in the light. You don't have to hide everything. You don't have to remember all the lies that you told. And what did I say to that person again? And, you know, because they'll all get caught up at some point, And then this person will say to this person, listen, you can just walk in the light and speak the truth. Because God has cleansed your heart. Amen? So that kind of judging is good. Okay, the second thing is, there, as we talked about with the speck, there is a rightful judging of other believers. After you judge yourself, after you get the log out, right, then you are to remove the speck. That's what Jesus said. He said, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You are to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Why? Because if you really care about him, just like Cindy with barbecue sauce on my face, you know, if you really care about your brother, you'll get involved. You'll say, look, you may not see this, but this is what the word says, and this is what you did, and you, or you hurt this person, or you hurt me, and 
you know, and, and you'll do it in a loving way just like you do it with your own family members. And, and, and if you don't, if you don't speak the truth like that in your own family, God help you to do so. Because there's you know, no relationship can ever survive where you don't speak the truth to each other. Amen? And that's the same in the body of Christ. So, yes, we have the responsibility. Don't say, well, I don't want to get involved. I'll let somebody else do that. No, no, no. No, Jesus says, look, you take the, the log out of your own eye so that you can remove the speck out of your brother's eye. That's the service in love that we are to do for one another. You know? And yeah, the, the whole attitude that you have behind it, the way you do it is everything, absolutely. Which is why you take the log out to begin with, you see. Okay, so what else did Jesus say? Well, he said... You know, rebuke your brother who sins against you. Well, that seems pretty strong. I think we've become a culture that just can't call something wrong anymore. You know, we're so afraid that we're... It, it'll be hate speech. Ooh. I, I might hurt somebody's little feelings, you know, if I tell them that, you know, lying is wrong. Uh, it... It, we're a kind of a messed up culture. But, but God says, look, Jesus said, look, if your brother sins against you, then rebuke him. Show him his fault privately, just between the two of you. He said, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, I'm sorry, you know, forgive me whatever, then forgive him. Wait a minute here. Okay, by the way, after Jesus said this, guess what the disciples said? Oh, Lord, increase our faith. Okay, now think about this. Just think this through. You, you, somebody sins against you. They say they lie, again. they lie to you. And you go to them and you say, you lied to me. And they say, you know what, you're right. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. An hour later, they lie to you again. You go back. You lied to me. You know you're right. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Okay, by, by time number two, I am questioning, is this repentance sincere? Okay, are you getting it? You know, that's what I'm thinking. After probably the second time, Jesus says, listen, if he comes seven times to you in the same day, and sins against you, and you rebuke him, and he says, I repent, I'm sorry. You forgive him. Whoa! Now, I, I, would start, I would question the sincerity of that repentance. Wouldn't you? But Jesus said, that's not your place. You're not their judge. You can't judge the motivation of their heart. It's not your place. And the point of this is, you are not to keep a record of how many times they said, I'm sorry. If they, if they said they're sorry, you confronted them, and, the, and, the, and they, you know, they said, I repent, I will try not to do that, forgive me, it was my bad, whatever. You forgive them, period. It's not your place to not forgive them. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily trust them, okay? That's two different things, okay? You may not want to give them that really uh, sort of confidential thing anymore if they have a problem with continuing to spout their mouth off and share it with people they're not supposed to share it with. You may learn from that and say, you know what, it's probably not best for me to confide in them. <laughs> okay? But that doesn't mean you don't forgive them. The difference. There's a difference between forgiveness and trust. Jesus says you forgive them. Seven times in one day. Why? Because you don't know what's in their heart, and that's not your place. You just forgive them. You did your part, now God will do his part. You know? Huh, that's intense. No wonder they said increase our faith. <laughs> All right, so how you go about doing this, though, you know... Um, If you really want to be effective, and if somebody has really hurt you, they've offended you in some way, 
and, and you are just upset, okay? And you're going to straighten them out, and that's okay. Go to them privately. But remember that you are best to really show them in the word where what they did was wrong. Don't just judge them on your own opinion, because sometimes our opinions about something are not necessarily the way God looks at it. I'm, I, might, I might think in my own opinion that this was not right, but they might think that in their opinion it was right, you know? And so that's not necessarily the best thing to go to your brother about and rebuke them for. You, wanna, you really want things that you know are black and white in the word of God. That this was wrong, and they did something wrong, and it's not right, and you're going to go to them in love, and you're going to show them from the word of God where this is not right. Okay? You don't always have to do it that way, but I'm just saying that if... The, well, this is what Paul said. Okay, here's why. He wrote to Timothy. He said, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The thing is, is that when you take them to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God then the Holy Spirit takes that word of God and brings conviction to the heart about what they have done. And that's why it is very important that if you're going to do this, you're going to do it well, you're going to do it effectively. You, you, you pray about it, obviously. Uh, and then you go and you, and you take them to the word of God. You know what? You did this, but the word of God says this. Maybe they've never even heard that before. Maybe they've never even seen it before. You know? But you see, this is what God says in his word. And now it's the word of God that's going to pierce their heart, you see. Because here's the deal. It isn't about you anyway. You know, I think sometimes we get all pushed out of shape if somebody has sinned. Well, wait a minute. All sin ultimately is against God. So why do you get pushed out of shape over somebody else's sin? Oh yeah, it might hurt you. I could get that. But why are you pushed out of shape over their sin? Their sin's ultimately against God. Your job as a child of God and, you know, as a fellow believer in the body of Christ, is to just be that vessel that God can use to help bring truth into their life so that they can see it. So you remove the speck, you see. But you, you know, why get all upset about it? Just simply do your duty as unto the Lord. Because God chooses to use us in the lives of one another. He chooses to you. Yes, God could do it on his own, but I... Oftentimes, God is doing it on His own. The Holy Spirit is speaking to that person about something. But now they're not listening. They've turned a deaf ear to God. And so God says, hey, you, you know, you go talk to them. You be my mouthpiece. Like He did with the prophets. Jeremiah, I've been reading through Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a, a terrible job. <laughs> I mean, he... He, he had to give these words at a time when the nation was dying and they were going to go into captivity and, and all of these false prophets are saying, hey, everything's fine, it's cool, everything's good. You're okay, I'm okay, we're all okay. And Jeremiah says, no, you're not okay. King Nebuchadnezzar is coming from Babylon, he's going to wipe everybody out and take them all captive. That was not a feel-good message, okay? There's not a single record of any convert that Jeremiah had in his entire ministry. You talk about a bum ministry, okay? That would be tough. But he was faithful. And why did God do that? Because God chooses to use human instruments to speak forth his word to people that need to hear it. And that might be you. It might be me. But this is how you do it effectively. You bring him back to the word of God. And you know that you're just, it's not about you. This is about God seeking righteousness in the house of God. And he may use us uh, in order to do that. I don't like it, to be honest. I hate, I hate that kind of stuff. But I know it's, it's part of the deal. And if you love people, you'll do it. And if you love God, you'll do it. Okay. Um, what else? Restore your brother who's caught in sin. Let's take a look at Galatians 6.1. It says... Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, 
considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay? So the, the former thing that we looked at was if somebody sins against you. This is if they just sin in general. It may not be against you. But you notice that they're caught, they're snagged by some sin. Jesus said, whoever sins is a slave to sin. It's going to kill them if they don't get out of it. And you see it. And so it says that if one of you is overtaken by some trespass, you who are spiritual, go to them. Go to them in a spirit of gentleness. And consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. I believe that the important phrase here is, you who are spiritual, restore in a spirit of gentleness. The idea here is to bring restoration. Amen? And you who are spiritual. That means that you're filled with the Spirit, you're led by the Spirit, you are equipped by the Spirit to do it. You're not just doing this on your own human understanding, but you're doing it because God has filled you with his heart to go do it. And you do it with the intention of not just pointing out their fault, but restoring them, getting them out of the pit. You're there to help them up out of the pit. And so you perform that duty. Why? Because you don't want to see the consequences of sin destroy them or their family or, or the, the ministry, their church, their ministry, their career, and on and on and on. And a real friend who is led by the Spirit will do that. Um, and then it says here, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, what's the burden here? The burden is sin. Sin is a burden. When there's sin in the body of Christ, that's a burden we all bear because we all suffer for it. And so we're to bear that just like Jesus bore our sins on the cross. He didn't deserve that. Why should he have to bear my sins? He didn't deserve that. He did it because of love. And so Paul says, look, we're to bear the burdens of one another in this way, and thus we fulfill the law of Christ, which is love. That is the law of Christ. So, let me just say that there are spiritual gifts that God gives for this purpose. I don't think we talk about these enough, honestly. But some of the gifts of the Spirit that God gives to believers... One of the gifts is the gift of discernment. Being able to discern, you know, what is a good spirit, what is an evil spirit. Uh, there is the gift of knowledge. That is to have God show you something that you could not know any natural way, but God shows you this is what's going on. You know, uh, I've had, Cindy has had this happen. I, early in our marriage, we had a youth pastor we were working with. We were in youth ministry together, and, she, and there was another youth worker. And Cindy one day says to me, they're having an affair. I said, Cindy, how dare you make such a statement like that, you know? How could you say that, you know? She's like, you know, and I just go to the bat for this guy, you know? Well, she absolutely, she turned out she was right. She just knew it. The Lord showed her. That's a gift of knowledge. Uh, there's a gift of wisdom which is, you know, how you see somebody in the sin, but how do you deal with it? Well, God gives you the, the wisdom and how to deal with it, you see? These are spiritual gifts that we need to operate. If we're walking in the Spirit, we need to be open to those spiritual gifts because God will use them, you know, in order to bring ultimate discipline in His church, bring cleansing to His church. So, so... I, so when Cindy and I were dating, okay, and uh, I'm just on this when I was dating with Cindy kick today, uh, but there was a staff member at our church, and uh, he, he, was, he had a girlfriend and stuff, and, and then um, our pastor's wife, the Lord woke her up in the middle of the night and said, they're having sex together, you know, 
Uh, and so she went to him and she said, listen, I, I believe the Lord just showed this to me, that you and so-and-so are, you know, being immoral. And, and he said, no, we're not. You know, and he totally denied it. And so she just said, okay. So she says, well, gee, I really blew that one, you know. Well, about two months later, guess who's pregnant? <laughs> and obviously showing. And, uh, and so he ultimately got fired. Not for the sexual transgression. If he would have repented, that would have been, you know, he would have repented. The main thing was he lied about it. He denied it. And that's why they fired him. Uh, so, so from that point on, you know, Cindy and I were dating, and we, we knew about this. And, you know, we were spending time together, courting, time alone. There are times when we're tempted to go too far, you know, physically. I, pro I was probably tempted more than she, honestly. <laughs> uh, but, but we just knew if we do anything, Mary's going to know, you know. <laughs> God's going to wake her up in the middle of the night. And, you know, I, I, we feared Mary more than we feared God, you know, honestly. Because of this, this gift of knowledge thing, you know. So it sort of put the fear of God into us. But um, one last scripture I want to look at. Hebrews 3.13 says, You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. That's the service we do for each other. Okay? Uh, and then the last thing we're going to look at here is that there's a rightful judging of unbelievers. Okay, you know, normally, you know, Paul would say, look, I, we judge what happens in the church, but God judges the people outside the church. However, there is a judgment that we do have to take care of here, and Jesus said it in verse 6, where he said, you know, um, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Okay, so how can I know what, who is a dog and who is a swine so that I don't give my pearls, which are those precious truths of the faith, you see? Those precious truths that God has shown me. Jesus said, don't just cast those out. Don't take your pearls and cast them before swine because they will have no regard for them. They will just trample them, and guess what? They'll turn and come after you and rip you to shreds, see? That's what he's saying. So we have to be able to make a decision and discern and distinguish between somebody who is... A dog, or a swine, or, because he's talking about unbelievers here, or simply a lost sheep. Someone who needs to hear the gospel. You know, clearly, if we never present the gospel to unbelievers, nobody's ever going to get saved. You know, Paul says, how will they believe unless they hear the message, and how will they hear the message unless somebody preaches to them? So, so, our job is to go to unbelievers with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in the process, you'll find that some people, they have no regard for it. And I really believe, if, if, if we get a little bit more hint about what's happening here, I think Peter gives us a little bit more insight. Peter said, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ... They are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Notice he uses the same Two animals here, a dog and a pig. And he says, look, if people have come to the knowledge of the truth, 
and they turned away from it, I believe he's speaking of reprobate people here. People that know the truth. You can't tell them anything they don't already know. They've been there, done that, and they've left it. You say, can they do that? Peter says so. And he's saying, if that happens, you know, you're wasting your time. Because like a dog going back to his own vomit. They tasted, notice here, they, they, they had the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they, they, uh, they'd known the way of righteousness. And they've turned deliberately from the Holy Commandment. And, and he says, there's nothing you can do. Now, does that, now here's the thing. There are people who are saved, who are believers, who go into sin. David is one of them. So there again, he was, he was still a child of God. But there are other people that probably, by their going back out of it, they're just proving that they never really were in to begin with. And you can make that point. But the point is, is that there are people that have re they've heard the truth, they're sort of immune to it now. And, and if you try to preach to them, you're, not only are you wasting your breath, they may come after you and seek to destroy you. Because they're that hateful against God. And I believe that's what Jesus is talking about here when he says, don't cast you know, your pearls before swine. But again, all of these things require that we make skilled, Holy Spirit-led judgments. And God will give us the ability to do that if we ask him. The purpose of all this is this. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, then what will the end of those who do not, you know, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Folks, there's, there cannot be any genuine revival unless there is first the judgment of sin in the church. And that's why Peter says, look, it's got to begin here. It has to begin in the house of God. It has to begin in our own hearts. There cannot be revival unless the church is confessing those things that we have done against God, against other people, and we get our own backyard cleaned up first, you see. And that is when revival happens. You look at any revival that has ever happened historically, it is always, there's always been a work of conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit, and people have said, I'm the guy. I'm the one. I'm the one who needs to repent. I'm the one that's not right. I'm the one that's left my first love. I'm the one that needs God's help. They stop pointing the finger at everybody else and they say, I'm the one. Lord, save me. Forgive me. And that has to happen. And that's why this is so important. It's so important first that we do to ourselves, but then also... If there's stuff going on in the, in the house of God that needs to be cleaned up, we need to clean it up. We need to get our priorities straight. Because it's just too important. There's too many dying people. And here's, here's the thing. After judgment happens in the house of God, and the, the, the church is the church that's pure and powerful, the way God wants it to be filled with the Spirit, guess what? That church is going to have a dramatic impact on the world around him. But if there's corruption and hypocrisy in the church, it ain't going to happen. That's why it has to begin with us. Last thing, I love this. All the purpose of this is, guess what? God is on your side. He loves you. And here's, here's the beautiful thing, that if you are in Christ, this is what Jesus is going to do. This is why he's giving you his Holy Spirit. This is why he's giving, he's giving you me to holler at you every Sunday, okay? <laughs> so that you'll go home. And I hope that you are convicted over some things today. I hope you go home and just say, oh, Lord, he's right. That's me. He's talking to me. And you confess it. You get real with God. Why? Because this is what he wants to do. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Guess you are his bride, folks. 
I know it's your guy, it's a little weird, but you know, you're his bride. And he's going to do everything he can by the Spirit, by his truth, to be able to present you on that day without fault, without wrinkle, and be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, my bride. Come into the, the wonderful, beautiful place that I have prepared for you. And that's why we need to judge this side of eternity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your presence, God, and we thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Jesus, you said that if we would abide in you, that we would be your disciples indeed, and we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. And I pray, Lord, that if any of us have become caught or ensnared in any sin, God, that you deal with us first personally on that, Lord. Help us be honest with you. Help us walk in the light as you're in the light. Thank you, Lord, that you made provision for us through the cross of Jesus Christ where the stain of our sins has been wiped out by the blood of Jesus. And Lord, you just ask that we would turn from those things and believe in you. And Lord, if there's people around us, Lord, if there's people around us that have stumbled, that are caught, I pray, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Help us deal with those things in a humble and gentle way, in a loving way, Lord, that truly judgment may begin in the house of God. And that, Lord, that we would be the people you want us to be. God, that, that we would fulfill the purpose you have for us. And Lord, that we wouldn't allow any corruption in our hearts or lives to go unchecked. But Lord, would you come and clean our hearts and make us right. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.